This is CS50 Explained, week zero continued, and we're here with our friend, Davin Armendariz. Hello. Good introduction. Well, you called me Davin. I'm Davin. All right. That's Davin. Speaking of Davin. <laughs> so we began this lecture with this hello from many of the course's staff from the previous year. I think I'm in this end. You are in this. You're one of that more awkward shots. One of my friends that I haven't heard from in a long time texted me recently to say that Saw you on the internet. Saw me on the internet. This video, apparently they're um, dentists, really? dentists are going through CS50 right now. My and who but each of them here is telling a little bit about their own experience in the class, and the goal is to put a face, hopefully that's familiar to students, that they recognize old friend or someone in their same dorm, to help it feel a little less foreign. That's Rob Bowden, our most senior member. Is Rob wearing the gloves? Teaching staff. No. <laughs> a little Brady Bunch effect there. My favorite memory is when I was on stage and I played <laughs> the prestigious role of a node in a linked list. When we Even if you don't know what that is, it's just horribly disappointing how the climax of that story. <laughs> That's my one cameo. That was an amazing look Nick made. Everyone's so expressive, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> Shelly got everyone to do this. This is Ramon, one of our undergrad producers. <laughs> Who took CS50? Dan Bradley, who made our binary bulbs, which you may recall from week zero. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Start the piece earlier in the week. I wonder if we're going to see Dan Bradley in any of these videos without a free T-shirt. <laughs> it's a thing. <laughs> so he's offering some advice. This is good. But again, the goal here was just to start class without saying a single word, just hitting play and engaging the audience right away. That's the goal. Is that to delay your own like? My nervousness. I know. <laughs> no, this was planned far in advance. CS50 is really great at providing ways to get help. My one piece of advice is there we go. It's sleep. Oh yeah, sleep for sure. Um, it's easy. But I didn't wear that same. That you same just talked over the funny part. Why? You were fun. You were unintentionally funny here. Unintentionally. We got a, we got a good laugh in the audience. Was it unintentional? Because you're gonna love it. I think we'd assume so. Shelly, <laughs> we put this together. Yeah. This is CS50. This is CS50. Oh, there's Dan Armandaris. This is CS50. You know, it's funny. Our motto, if you will, this is CS50, happened completely organically, whereby a few years ago, one of our first websites for the course had different links to like lectures and sections and problem sets. And each of those web pages had a title, like lectures or sections or problem sets. But then, of course, there's the index.html page or equivalent, which doesn't really have a name. And saying homepage feels kind of lame. And it used to say welcome. And then I think on a whim one day, I decided to be kind of cute, as I thought, and just said, OK, what is this? This is CS50, period, save. and just. Thus was born the new homepage. And then one of our teaching fellows, uh, Yuki Yamashita from a few years ago, uh, adopted this essentially as our slogan, uh, presumably thinking I put way more thought into it than I actually had. But it's actually come to, I think, be a very w apt statement um, to describe any number of things that we actually do in the course. This is CS50. I think everyone just assumes you put a lot of thought into that. You normally I do, year. and yet that just happened very organically. Well, so you said a few years ago. Do you mean eight years ago? <laughs> uh, that probably happened. I think I did that in 2008 or so. Maybe give or take, yeah. Now, this, this is actually a sweater. It's not a sweatshirt, but in retrospect, it looked a little more casual than I intended that first week. So Are you critiquing your own I am, the choice? wardrobe, wow. uh, which was okay. provided by Malin. <laughs> um, but someday we'll, we'll chip away at that. <laughs> it was only on. Actually, it is useful having videos of every time you teach because otherwise it's very easy to wear like the same thing, mm -hmm. which I actually now do intentionally. But suppose that you want to wear something different every week. Uh, it is not uncommon for me to like pull up the previous lecture's video to see what did I wear last time. I've done that and then, as well. Really? Yeah. yeah. But now I've just kind of embraced uh, a black sweater of some sort and jeans of some color. I remember a funny anecdote that you told me from one of the first times you were teaching. You thought you looked way too young, so you intentionally wore. <laughs> A suit and glasses to try to look older. 1999, I was still a senior in college. I was teaching computer <laughs> science E1, understanding computers and the internet. And I swear to God, I was the youngest person in the room because it was mostly adults pursuing a continuing education course, um, in that case, that I inherited. And yeah, I had my glasses, I had a suit, I had suspenders. The last time I wore suspenders, suspenders was 1999. Wow. And now I've That's clearly gone the other direction. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, so here we <laughs> See, this is one of the, we have an amazing photo of this. Like, everyone looks so interested in the class. <laughs> really, they just want a free they just 3D printed elephant. Yeah. <laughs> Which very opportune thing. photo. But Chang, one of our staff members, pictured right there, in fact, um, very kindly started printing an, ar <laughs> an army of plastic elephants that look like this using a MakerBot printer that we got early in the term for students to build chassis and cases and other things. So you never see this much interest in computer science than when you're giving away plastic elephants. There's a lesson in here somewhere. But, no, I just, I, I remember the MakerBot in the office just constantly going going off with the uh the Yeah, it's just, just literally printing an army of elephants. And to this day, we haven't given hours. all of them out, so we actually don't know where most of the elephants really? are. Printed, we overlaid some sexy music to it in order to give you this look at how 3D printing works. And even though this is actually in plastic, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> popcorn. But <laughs> this was very deliberate <laughs> to introduce 3D Take printing. So this is very right now, 2014, 2015. 3D printing is very much in vogue, even though I think the state of the art is a little ahead of its time. It, the, the machinery does not work particularly well, certainly not for complex uh, objects. Well, just the. Uh, the, the consumer machines, probably. The could. consumer machines, yes, yeah. Um, so here you're seeing um, a CS50 iPhone stand being printed. Over time lapse. That uh, I think Chang took that. One of our staff members made. Yes, but that's another. Uh, Chang time took lapse. the time lapse of the CS50 iPhone holder that which Ansel modeled. Yes, yep. exactly. This is Lauren Carvalho, one of our former head teaching fellows. Here I have, I think, another phone book, just to tie together the previous class. We're not going to tear this one again. But the goal of the second class, which for Harvard happens at the end of the week on a Friday instead of a Wednesday, um, it's probably a large intersection of students who came to the first lecture. So we don't want to rehash material, but I do kind of want to tie things together and give the students attending for the first time a mental model, at mm -hmm. least for what they missed, even though, of course, the video was online. I do want to point out that in the last video, we were talking about the old uh, binary uh, example that you had where you had eight students up mm -hmm. on stage and each one had a sheet of paper representing each place and then you would ask them to raise the appropriate ones mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for a given number. Um, that didn't happen. Are we going to see that this week? So it varies by year, to be honest, like, especially since everything is available online and especially since these days there's a non-trivial number of students who partially engage with the semester and then come back the next semester to take the actual class. I'll admit I just have misgivings about reusing the same material again and again, so I try to vary it just a little bit. So the short answer is it depends by semester. Sometimes I deliberately omit or introduce different things just to vary it a little bit. And also because we've started to see, especially with the online offerings of CS50 through Harvard's Extension School for continuing ed credit and also through edX, uh, yes. the MOOC version, a lot of students come back the next year and re-engage and try their hand at the course again or just go through it to fill in some gaps or reinforce material. So my hope to some extent is that even the second iteration of a course for someone is still engaging for them and it's not just a replay. So here we are just rehashing briefly um, or looking back at the pseudocode we came up with last time. Well, it's interesting you mentioned this, that you try not to go over material multiple times across iterations. Um, so why do you spend so much time at the beginning of the next lecture going over material that they would could presumably rewind and watch So this is a little sleep. anomalous because this is Harvard's so-called chopping week where students are coming and going and uh, sitting in on any class they want without yet registering. And so the goal here was just, again, to make sure that, one, students who missed Wednesday had a little bit of a context for what they missed. But even for the, new, the students who were with us on Wednesday, to give them a bit of reinforcement of the material. Right? They probably just attended four, eight, 16 classes over the course of just two or three days because they're sitting in and popping out. Um, so I wanted to make sure everyone was still comfortable and that they didn't worry that this is going to be one of those classes that accelerates super fast and if they miss it once, that's it for the term. <laughs> On occasion, I'll still look back briefly at what we did last time to just kind of tie the lectures together and also even though yes it's on video in a room full of hundreds of students surely not everyone is going to be so diligent as to go back and watch the tail end of a lecture for instance to tie it together themselves so that's a role we can play 
So, no, please, go ahead. I, well, mine is just a technical note. You'll see that the microphone I wear these days, it used to be a lapel mic, something like I'm wearing right now. But if you're moving around a lot and it has some weight to it, like the cable does, it tends to tug on your shirt. And so, stupid fun fact, for years people assumed that I always wore V-neck sweaters. I have never once worn a V-neck sweater in class. In fact, I hate V-neck sweaters, but it always looked like it because <laughs> of the weight. And so we finally, at a conference called NAB, National Association of Broadcasters, found a microphone that does not do the sort of Britney Spears style thing where the boom mic comes all the way to your mouth, but rather it sits just at your sideburn, which has actually mm -hmm. been great because it's pretty minimalist. You see mm -hmm. it walking around um, on the video, but at least for the audience, it doesn't look like you're you know, giving a motivational talk or something like that. It does look a little uh, American Idol, though. A little bit, yeah, but at least it's not across your cheek, which I just think looks ridiculous. Also, I hope, did you make that comment because I'm wearing a, a V-neck shirt? Right well, it's not really a V-neck. It's more of a normal collared shirt that's forming, well, no, but the forming a V. I don't know what's under there. Okay, yeah, okay. that's probably for the best. <laughs> so what's going on here with the... Uh, so this is a video that our friends at TED put together. They emailed me um, a couple years ago now and asked if I might like to contribute a script for a, an animated um, educational video. And so I wrote a script explaining what an algorithm was using counting of people in a room. And this is an example, which is something we actually do in class quite often. And they then uh, proceeded to animate it in this way. And I like it. My misgiving, frankly, pedagogically, is that the video is a little long. It's about five minutes, which at least in a captive audience uh, environment feels a little long. Um, and I also think it, we unduly animated it. There's just so much visual going on. Like the numbers one, two, and three, it's essentially graph paper, but a funky looking one, two, and three. And I think these are visual distractions. So pedagogically, if we were to do it again, I would have uh, aspired for us to come up with a much simpler representation of this information so that you, the students aren't distracted by the, the bells and whistles, but focus on the material. But I think this is very representative of the style these days of this sort of video, isn't it? Where it is know, meant just, to be visually Like, why is exciting. the wall graph paper there is what I wonder why the numbers look so weird. Like, I just, tell me that's one, two, three. I, I just find these to be, I don't know, uh, uh, visually distractions. A and there's so much new this material is, already. This is a glimpse into the thought process that goes behind the, the class, perhaps. Well, uh, I think... I'd have to listen really closely. I think we're actually playing the video back at 1.1x speed here, too. Oh, really? So as to accelerate it, to make it shorter without it becoming uh, like Alvin and the Chipmunks. It's funny because one of the things I remember from it was that your voice sounded so strange. No, it doesn't sound strange. This is my voice. Oh, okay. Well, then it's just strange. If you play it at like 2x, I start to sound squeaky. <laughs> the VLC, which is a video player I often use, I'm not using it here, is actually great because you can speed up the playback of videos, such as uh, class lectures. Uh, but without <laughs> distorting that much the audio. Mm -hmm. It actually does a much better job than a lot of software. Mm -hmm. So here we're introducing the idea of a variable, then the idea of a loop, and then the idea of an assignment or an update here. And so the goal here was to, without talking about C and without talking about any actual programming language, to introduce some of the basic building blocks that we're going to want to assume in the days to come. Mm -hmm. And in fact, later in this lecture, do we introduce the first programming language, Scratch, that we use in the class, which will have these same constructs, but with, programming, uh, with puzzle pieces instead of text. Mm -hmm. So has Ted used this animation in context outside of CS50? They've made it publicly available. They have a whole series of uh, educational videos like these in addition to their well-known TED Talks. Mm -hmm. um, so we were just one part of that initiative. Yeah. So it was great. Hands down, it's, it's been a wonderful resource online. Um, and even we use it in class on occasion, so I'm really just nitpicking when I say if I were to do it again, I would have trimmed my script, made it tighter mm -hmm. um, to help us spin through this faster. But what you're about to see, too, is right now I'm using the algorithm of counting by twos, which works great if you have an even number of people in the room, but if there's an odd number like zero or one or three or more, then of course this is going to be buggy, <laughs> which is a little creepy with the bugs crawling on the code. Um, but the goal here is to now introduce the uh, handling of a corner case. Like, what if there is an odd number of people? How do you handle that? And I propose to introduce it here. In retrospect, <coughs> excuse me, got to lay off the popcorn. There is a nuance here that I think was lost on me at first, whereby I deliberately used the syntax for each pair of people in room. But a number of people online, in YouTube comments and the like, have pointed out that that could be interpreted combinatorically as for every possible pair of people in the room, which would not be the, the math we want here. I just meant pair the two adjacent people. 
but I don't know if I regret the simple formulation of it there, because for each pair of people in the room, I feel is the simplest way to describe counting by twos. Mm -hmm. But a fair point that even um, reasonable people or unreasonable person and reasonable people can disagree. Mm -hmm. So you see a little foreshadow here. Normally we would try to hide such a thing, but we have three shopping bags and a table uh, filled with some peanut butter, jelly, bread, knives, uh, and plates mm -hmm. for a demonstration that's on the horizon. And you're carrying around a bowl. Indeed, this is a glass <laughs> bowl. For what purpose? I want it to represent a, a variable or a container, uh, and just to make super explicit what it means in a computer program to store some value, since at least in algebra, students probably think of X and Y and Z and the like as very abstract things. And I wanted to make a little more clear that we could put something physical into something else physical, and think of that as a variable, something that stores some value. Excuse me. <coughs> I remember finding this actually just a little confusing because it, it, Damn it. <laughs> well, just because it, it kind of um, implies that that it holds multiple yeah, things. Yeah, I know where you're going with this. And, and also, I was also a little bit confused that you have this object that is meant to be this container, and this container has a name, and yet it also has the, the contents. So if you, yeah. have you considered, so it sounds like you were, you have already have like, thought through. I haven't used that this. example since, um, at least in other teasers. I agree. Well, and to be clear here, you're objecting to the fact that the bowl can hold one golf uh, ping pong ball or two or three. And of course, that's more storage. It's not using, it's, it's sending a mixed message that you can store multiple right, things is. inside right. of a bowl. Right. You're holding multiple of one object rather than Better might have been, frankly, to maybe view the binary bulbs, which are on this big metal chassis, as that is a storage container. And maybe we can make it look like that by actually putting a case around it or something like that. But that would be more representative of reality, since there's eight bits and you just permute the pattern of ones that are on and off. Either at the very beginning or the very end, depending on how you do it. So here we're teasing apart in more verbal detail some of those concepts to make clear explicitly what the video was perhaps communicating a little implicitly. I agree on the bowl thing. I think that should be nixed altogether, that's sending a mixed message. Unfortunately, some of my spontaneous ideas like uh, picking up a bowl on the way to class or asking a teammate to uh, not go over so well. So was the bowl a, a popular thing? Did you keep no, no one wanted the bowl, no which is ironic because we won't need it anymore. But honestly, I don't necessarily regret it because a lot of what we do in class is these spontaneous realizations like, oh, that would be interesting to try. So I do think there's an evolution to this class and any class I've taught over the years whereby you try something and if it fails, so you don't do it again. But hopefully more often than not, they succeed. Mm -hmm. Like I love how the binary bulbs turned out. Mm -hmm. Which of course was the result of desk lamps the year prior. Mm -hmm. So this is always a challenge because even though I try to make a point of introducing myself to every student that comes up on stage, I'm meeting them generally for the first time. They tell me their names. I swear to God, five seconds later, I have forgotten the conversation I just had. <laughs> There's a lot of pressure. Uh, with all these eyes on you, but <laughs> I need to get better at that. Starts a list of pseudocode, if you will. And what I want to do here ultimately is type. So are you soliciting pseudocode from the audience and they will execute that pseudocode? Correct. So this, yes, this is deliberately meant to be a two sided um, uh, uh, demonstration, whereby we not only have the three human volunteers on stage. Ideally, I want to engage a non-zero number of students in the audience as well, so that there's multiple roles being played here. Now, surely not everyone in the audience is going to participate, but the goal here is for the students in the audience to hopefully <laughs> see themselves and their classmate or friend who's actually on stage and maybe be thankful that they are not they. <laughs> this is really just a stupid internet thing that felt apropos to this, play. This meme is a little... It's a little, it's a little I'm showing my age here. <laughs> but that's the thing, most of the students haven't seen this yet. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah I, I suppose. I let it go on a little long. But I was also simultaneously <laughs> testing Google Glass, which is a bit out of vogue now. It was very in vogue in 2013, 2014 less so, and now 2015, way less so. But we wanted to put it on one of our volunteers, Rob, okay, in this you, case. You were able to merge the videos too. Yeah, no, the production team did a great job here. And even though the video quality is obviously worse, 
it's just meant to be a fun way of really helping the online student too see what it's like to be on stage, especially if physically they'll never have the opportunity to travel to campus. Make sure you should just have Rob wear a helmet with a GoPro <laughs> on top. And Use we that. could. Well, we increasingly have more and more cameras in here. So, for instance, we have a couple of cameras typically behind where you and I are right now, pointing up on the Sander stage. We have one behind me that captures the audience. We sometimes mm -hmm. have, uh, we've experimented with the balcony shot, mm. and then, of course, Google Glass, which mm -hmm. is Rob literally <laughs> looking up at the, at the ceiling. Open the bag of so this is an example that other CS um, faculty have surely used over the years. In fact, they've, they've pointed out as much to me. But I genuinely think I got this example from my fifth grade teacher who used this same <laughs> demo as an opportunity to teach us kids how to follow or not follow instructions. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't so much about computational thinking as it was about just being correct in following one's steps. But it works wonderful, uh, wonderfully for us all these years later. So Rob was uh, deliberately hamming it up, and it's good. And that's why, to be honest, in executing this, I often choose uh, someone who knows where the opportunities for silliness are. So Rob, in this case, because he's a TF and ha has long been a TF, and um, knows where we're going with this. And then two students uh, who have no familiarity with what's about to go on. Mm -hmm. But the goal is that it's a missed opportunity, I think, if you don't have someone going a little over the top and sort of misinterpreting instructions deliberately. And students might be a little more inclined to follow along truly, right. whereas Rob or I or any other member of the staff could ham it up more, well, uh, more effectively. So here we have an opportunity to talk about pseudocode and try to distill what the class is proposing. Mm -hmm. And I'm just... <laughs> typing it up on the screen here. This is uh, So now they're, they're starting to be more precise, perhaps, but not necessarily yeah. concise with their instructions. But you will notice this was I, lack of uh, forethought on my part. I forgot that I was going to have to type these instructions, so I ended up using the sticky application, yeah. um, which I could surely have come up with something that does a little more in the way of like a bulleted list or a numbered list automatically. But that's OK. We'll keep it real. <laughs> Okay. This is made he for holding a great on to shot. the he's holding on to the the sharp end of the knife. Hold could be. Oh boy. The there we go. We fixed it. <laughs> Good. That could have hurt. Hold yeah. So the goal here, honestly, especially since we're spending quite a few minutes on this, is really to just have this memorable moment on stage so that when students do think about writing code, they at least appreciate that okay, you have to be precise and you have to think about the so-called corner cases. What might happen? if the computer takes you literally. <laughs> but hands down, this is meant to be more of a fun right, moment than nine. something that's rigorously, I think, substantive. Mm -hmm. But again, I think, I hope that it also does help to send that message. Has it always been peanut butter jelly sandwiches? I changed it once. I did this with an audience full of folks from entirely from Brazil. Um, and Gabriel, our head teaching fellow, who's also from Brazil, uh, suggested that I use a different type of jelly and a different type of bread to put together something right, that would be a little 10. more Brazilian than hmm. American. But otherwise, PBJ seems to be yes. the go-to option. <laughs> What's nice too, and it's, this is okay, stupid implementation details for teachers out there. When you go to the, uh, the supermarket to buy the supplies, you ideally want to find like a peanut butter or jelly jar that actually has a plastic top, not metal, Step so that if you do take the knife and thrust it into the cap, the, yeah. you can actually um, <laughs> pierce it. Honestly, too, we sometimes do pre-cut. Um, we didn't in Rob's case, but when I do it, I'll often pre-cut the top of the lid in such a way that you can't see it on camera, but so that, frankly, I don't slice my hand open when I put the knife through the top of the jar. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you want to kind of think this through, lest uh, it turn into your bloodiest lecture yet. <laughs> Has, um, have there been any major accidents? No major accidents, no, thankfully. I've never permanently hurt myself. Sometimes we get the squeezable because it's funny. So essentially, you go to the supermarket, you look at the shelves, and you decide what to get based on what looks funniest, mm -hmm. which is a strange criterion to use when shopping for food, usually. <laughs> The other hard thing here is we, I feel like we buy metal knives once a year, even though I don't know where they go. But we're not very good at keeping the PBJ supplies all in one place, so the knives tend to disappear. 
Or jelly falls out. So this is, ob this is obviously a horribly written program. Oh, it's yeah. just kind of devolving into a mess. But again, that's not the point here. Um, if it were, we would prefabricate these. But we also use this as an opportunity often before class um, in the form of a homework assignment, not this year, but where we ask students to write a program in pseudocode for making a PBJ sandwich. And then I take a, a deliberately chosen sample of those submissions and mm -hmm. act them out on stage. So that's another way of doing this as well if you want to have a little more control over the pedagogy and the, the storyline. Is there something other than peanut butter and jelly sandwich that would maybe not be so wasteful of food that we could? I know, I do always feel bad. But usually one of the TFs takes the food home to his or her dorm, so even though... The do they eat the, uh, the final uh, it's sandwiches It's rare, there's often create. a lot of hands that go into making the sandwiches, <laughs> so I wouldn't necessarily eat the first one. <laughs> Um, other food, I'm sure. I mean, my go-to is just PBJ, partly because of my fifth grade teacher. It feels like mm -hmm. a nice little homage to that. Oh boy, Drops that's all a, the jelly. This is good. Bit. This is good TV. <laughs> that's too bad it's not on TV. Yeah, Rob's being a little extravagant with the bread usage here. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of like undo commands in the program, essentially. <laughs> But you know what's interesting about these kinds of demonstrations, honestly, is that you really have no control over this. Like Rob and I did not rehearse this or talk through what he was going to do. I think it's more fun if it's just completely organic. But you have to yield control over the class and you have to make sure that you can rein things in so that it doesn't devolve into just complete silliness. So I would generally say that I eventually feel you get a sense of the pulse of the class and you decide, okay, it feels like we have time for like one or two more steps. And so I'll verbally say that, like, let's do five more steps or two more steps. Because I also think you don't want the audience members worrying that like, this is dragging on and on, like, why are they wasting my time? So you kind of want to bound things so that people know you're going to move on to some new context soon. But hopefully those two students won't soon forget their participation in the second day of CS50 that year. For better or for worse. <laughs> Doesn't mean my mic sometimes starts to slide off my ear, so we have some technical challenges and moving around so much. So we've seen the desk a couple of times that you seem to use this fancy lectern. What a nice plant here for our own Ansel Duff. Yes, we did custom build that lectern. Oh, how fancy. So, yeah, so we usually had for years a very traditional wooden lectern. It's very pretty, especially for the aesthetics of the theater, but like the top of it is permanently slanted at an angle that does not lend itself to typing very well, and it's also a very narrow surface, so I can only fit like one laptop and not that in the surface and something else in my notes. So Ansel, um, one of our graduating engineers at, um, at the college, um, spent last summer with us, and one wonderfully has the skill set with which to do CAD or computer-aided design and to actually build something um, in software. Is computer-aided design, computer-assisted design? I'm not sure. I think CAD. aided. Yeah, aided? CAD. Okay. CAD design. So he was able, not CAD design, CAD. So he was able to create in software a three-dimensional model of the lectern. And then he and Dan Coffey, another uh, member of the team, provided feedback iteratively on what we thought might look best and function best. So there's a few secret compartments and shelves on which we store some of the various technologies we use. And yeah, and then he um, sent it out to a local shop to cut the actual metal and uh, to weld it together mm -hmm. so that we have a custom lectern. Which just, it's such a simple thing, but it was just easier to and more correct to build it. And being engineers, it felt like the right thing to do anyway, even though I didn't have that skill set myself. So he helped solve an actual problem for us. But this too, I think, is consistent with the uh, this is CS50 thing. Like, uh, I mean, how many of your classes at MIT and Berkeley had their own custom lecterns for one class? I mean, I'm not sure I would know. Well, it's probably zero, right? It's probably zero. Okay, let's say it's zero. I'll that's what I, was, that was, what I was trying to <laughs> coax out of you there. Um, but that's representative of our having tried to solve some problem. And it's not perfect. We realized a few imperfections afterward. For instance, that front metal panel is actually pretty heavy, and we don't have enough uh, magnetic strength on the magnets that are there. So uh, on occasion, it might fall down on you. Have you ever kicked it during a lecture? And no, but that would definitely kick it off. <laughs> Um, so, like in software, version 2 could be even better, mm -hmm. but it's definitely been a huge step forward for us. So here we're introducing Scratch, and what's I think key takeaway here, pedagogically, is that 
One, we're introducing this so that students realize that programming doesn't need to be about some arcane syntax using a keyboard, but can be very accessible visu visually using puzzle pieces that snap together if it makes logical sense to do so. We spend just a few minutes really talking about Scratch. I try to give them the vocabulary, like here's the stage, here's the scripts area, here's your palette of puzzle pieces or blocks. And then I point out a few of the most useful ones, the entry points, the loops, the condition. But for the most part, we wave our hand at most of these puzzle pieces. And I think that's consistent with the fact that it's designed for students 12 or so and up in terms of age. So you don't need to spoon feed any audience the particulars, because it's also just very accessible once you orient students, I think, within the software. So why do you choose to use Scratch as opposed to some of the other block languages like Blockly or? Yeah, there's a lot now. There so there weren't in the beginning. So we introduced Scratch in 2007. To my knowledge, we were the first college level class to be using it. And that was completely fortuitous because as a grad student the year or two prior, um, I had sat in on Mitchell Resnick's class at uh, the MIT Media Lab. And he is the professor whose research group developed this uh, yeah. with John Maloney and others, Scratch itself, the software. And so he very graciously let us try it out in our own class the summer before and then in CS50. And it's just worked wonderfully well, to be honest. They, they doesn't, there are no problems that we would be solving by transitioning to any number of other block languages these days. Um, and it's only gotten better. Now with Scratch 2.0, it's web-based so that the projects are all the more accessible. Uh, it also allows you to create custom procedures or functions, which has been great, especially for our more advanced students. So there's a higher ceiling now for students. In fact, that's what we struggled with years ago. With Scratch 1.0, there is, for the students with prior background, are more comfortable in the class. There's only so much they could squeeze out of it that wasn't just easy and familiar. So we used to have a lot of physical scratch boards, little logic boards that connect via USB to a computer, and they allow you to touch buttons or turn knobs or generally provide environmental input to a program. Um, but that was just mechanically hard to handle in the course of a week, handing out hundreds of scratch boards. So Scratch 2.0 does have, as Mitchell would say, a much higher ceiling, which allows us to um, take it further for students more advanced. Yeah, and for, it's actually not so, you kind of alluded to this idea that there are hardware, there's hardware available that actually communicates with Scratch and some of the other block level languages. And this actually is, I think, really useful for courses that use the block level languages for longer is that there's a really good opportunity for neat projects. Yeah. Like there's some robots, for example, that can be programmed using the, the block level languages. And yeah. so you actually get to program a robot to move around and to use some of its sensors to actually, like you said, detect its environment and be able to react to hitting a chair, for example, and turning around and doing those sorts of things. Those are neat. I agree. If we didn't have other goals that we wanted to satisfy within the course of the term, like uh, we would hands down play with more physical objects like robots and uh, mind Lego Mindstorms or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I wish I had those things growing up. So why, it's, it feels a little strange, I think, to, for students to go from this extremely easy to, easy to use, easy to approach block level language, which, like you said, is designed perhaps for, for children, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden going into the language of C, which can be very, it's probably considered one of the more advanced languages, or at least in the, in the sense of, you know, the, the, the sorts of people that use it now, they tend to be advanced, like hackers and doing that sort of thing, mm -hmm. writing, writing low-level stuff. So what, uh, why do, why, why provide this jump? Why not go directly into C, or why not go a softer landing from Scratch into a, a different language? That's a good question. Definitely a leap from Scratch to C, which we'll do at the beginning of week one. Um, but it is smoothed significantly by starting with Scratch instead of starting with C. And by that I mean the fact that we're focusing today on concepts in most any programming language or most any um, imperative programming language like conditions and loops um, and statements and, and more as we'll soon see. We're giving them a mental model for some just very useful ideas that we even saw previously in the pseudocode, like searching for Mike Smith in the phone book, but now we're putting more words to it and also presenting it in another language, not pseudocode, but Scratch's puzzle pieces. And you'll see in the beginning of week one that Scratch's purpose for me pedagogically is that I have a number of slides, super simple slides, that show Scratch blocks on one side and then corresponding roughly equivalent C code. And for me, those slides are invaluable because I'm hopeful and I do sense that it does make a very strong connection for students between those concepts and the far less interesting aesthetics of C code. Whereas in 
any year pass before the course introduced something like Scratch, you immediately do dive into that deep end. And not only do you have to wrestle with the idea of a loop or a condition or a statement, you also have to deal with the parentheses and the semicolons and the curly braces and all this other visual distraction that has no intellectual value really, certainly not in the first day, that ends up causing students more confusion and angst than is need be. So the, for us, Scratch is a bridge. It's a bridge from the intuitive understanding of programming and even pseudocode to the more arcane but more powerful, ultimately, C environment and the Linux environment that we then spend quite a bit of time in. Talked about something that's interesting, which is that you want to talk about the concepts of programming more than the mechanics of it, mm -hmm. perhaps. And so that's why you introduced the block level language. So why not use the block level language for longer? and relegate C to like you do PHP or JavaScript later in the class yeah. and spend less time on that when arguably students will, especially those that are not planning to go into the depths of computer science but instead are just trying to get an understanding of the, of the topics, they may not necessarily be interested in the language of C itself. Yeah. Um, I do, there's a little more, I think there's more runway in Scratch than we allow it um, because we don't talk in much detail about custom puzzle pieces and for instance the support it does have for procedures and argument passing and I do think we could squeeze for something like CS50 a good two weeks out of it and maybe even two problem sets but I do think it's diminishing marginal returns over time and while I think there's some untapped potential there for us I certainly wouldn't want to spend a whole semester using something like Scratch alone, um, even with a much younger audience or a broader demographic, because I don't think that it has um, a sufficient opportunity to introduce some complexity and more sophisticated problem solving. Um, for that, I want something a little more traditional, because I also want students in CS50 to exit also with some practical skills. And even though C itself would not be the language to go to uh, for most problems um, these days, um, it's also the found, it's the next foundation, a layering, if you will. So pseudocode to Scratch to C to then some PHP, JavaScript, which are very syntactically similar and also conceptually quite similar. So I don't doubt we could have squeeze more time and value out of it, mm -hmm. but again, I think uh, the inflection point for us would be within one or two weeks total. So I can see that, that, especially with early iterations of Scratch, before they had the custom blocks, which were essentially, which are essentially functions, mm -hmm. and when variable support was very low, that there's only a couple of weeks that you could get out of it. But nowadays, the, all of the block level languages have really become pretty advanced. The one, the one coming out of Berkeley called Snap allows for even advanced computer science concepts like higher order functions and these sorts of things. And so just to sort of reply to my own question mm -hmm. with an example out of Berkeley. So Berkeley's introductory class, CS10, uses the block level language SNAP mm -hmm. for the duration of the class. And uh, that works really well in some sense because the idea is you abstract away the need to learn all of the, the, the syntax of C, which mm -hmm. Arguably, a lot of the students probably struggle with is that they oh, sure. forget a semicolon and, and trying to learn how, what the error message is when they miss a semicolon is maybe a non trivial amount of time that first time, especially. But there are other issues that arise with it as well, and that is that these block level languages, especially by the end of a semester of a programming class, just become unwieldy. They're huge. The final projects coming out of these yeah. students are very, very large and uh, somewhat difficult for them to. Yeah, to I'm deal sure. with in a, on a, in, a, in a good in a good way, like we have. I agree. And to be honest, the, the, the text-based language. One of the goals for me with CS52 is just the practicality. Like I want students to be exiting in, with skills and savvy and conceptual framework that they can then go apply to actual problems in their own domains. Even if they never take another CS course, I want them to be able to go back to their pre-med curriculum or their humanities studies, social sciences, and actually have sufficient exposure to some very common and modern tools with which they can then apply. And so for me, with what we want to get out of CS50, which effectively is the combination of a CS1 and CS2 course all in one semester, is I just want us to cover even more. And spending a whole semester on a purely block-based or graphical language wouldn't achieve that particular goal. So with that argument, why not focus on some other tools um, that people outside of computer science would be very likely to, to use? So um, perhaps the idea of scripting a computer instead, so... You, um, Sorry, I'm a little distracted Yeah, these, by this MIT. is actually yeah. pretty... <laughs> but go pretty on. Funny. So some other... So, so something maybe even a little higher level, like uh, dealing with 
just as an example, macros in Excel, for example, which can be, which can require some elements of programming. Why not go into some of those rather than, oh, uh oh. <laughs> Why? She gets better and better. Oh, um, oh, no. We could. My answer, to be honest, is it's not to be dismissive, but there's only so much time in the semester, and I'm not sure going, yeah, introducing students to an office style application is among our goals, to be honest, or my own personal goals. I'd rather they have a lower level programmatic ability coming out of 50. And I should say, with regard to these scratch programs, both of which involve volunteers coming up on stage, we're very deliberately chosen. Every year I try to look at the previous year's submissions and ask the teaching fellows to help chime in as to the most fun or most complex um, or most cute, uh, cutest programs that their students have submitted so that we can indeed have students come up and also just visually and audially engage the audience, so we almost always choose something that's got some fun music, that's got some interactivity, some com uh, some uh, competitive aspect to it, like point system or whatnot, so that students in the audience can really start to root for their classmates. Mm -hmm. And that one was great too, about the one involving different universities and progressively the institutions like MIT being among the smartest <laughs> algorithm that it had. <laughs> So this is just the process by which now I'm introducing a number of examples. And years ago, I actually introduced quite a few more examples in class and more methodically went from very simple to medium difficulty to more complex ones. But I found that it very quickly gets fairly dry. Um, and so what we instead did a few years ago is we I'm shot... already bored. <laughs> with, with this or this? Huh? What? Both. Okay. Um, so I'll just... Okay. So a few years ago, we started shooting a number of walkthroughs with CSOD's own Dan Coffey on the production team, where I walk students through on video all 100 plus of the course's coding examples, not only in Scratch, but also in C. And that's actually been wonderfully empowering to have these canonical versions that introduce a program from start to finish, so that if in class it feels like we don't have time or if it would be a little too dry to introduce in person on a stage like this, well, we can point students to the resource online as part of the homework or part of the pre or post readings for the class. And that's actually been amazing because it has freed me to go where the conversation goes to take more questions in class and generally adapt dynamically as opposed to thinking like, got to stick to the schedule, got to get through all 10 of these examples, which is surely not the best approach. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that CS50, especially over time, has become a lot more so I'm going to be a little distracted this, by the Yeah, now. but the meowing. <laughs> choosing an opportune moment to say smart things. I keep waiting. All right, so, um, so it seems like yeah, it's talk been... over this guy. Oh, yeah, I mean, obviously, that's the <laughs> monotone part. So, here, so CS50 seems to be going more towards the style of a, of a flipped classroom, where a lot of the pedagogy happens outside of lecture. So not, not to say that there's not a pedagogical utility to lectures because obviously we're mm -hmm. going over some of these important concepts but you pulled out all of the descriptions of how to get started on problem sets and how to get, how to approach some of these so the, the walkthroughs that you were just talking about yeah. and, and, and describing um, do you think that that trend is going to continue so to such a degree that even this, for example, might move to some video that students watch before or after class and then come into office hours or section and then work on their practical problem sets. I would say CS50 has long had an emphasis on the hands-on aspect, the sections, the office hours, and the like. So I wouldn't even say that's something particularly new, even though we're much more visible on campus and in those incarnations thereof. And we definitely emphasize those. Um, and I hate the expression flipped classroom, as though it's sort of a novel idea to like have students work on hands-on activities while you roam about. I mean, that's what like high school teaching was for me when I taught high school math for a while, and certainly what I remember of being a high school and middle school student. And so it's sort of been this, uh, I've been fascinated, to put it gently, that universities are just discovering this opportunity to not stand on stage talking at students, but actually mingle around and supporting them more one-on-one -on -one or in group-wise arrangements. But with that said, I do think we have had a trend in CS50, and we've gotten better at optimizing lectures for what they are good for. So my hope is that week zero, uh, first lecture, and even this lecture to a large extent, have an engagement aspect to them, have maybe even a little bit of inspiration or at least excitement about what's on the horizon. And so what we've increasingly tried to do in CS50 is only use in lecture 
the kind the material that lends itself to that kind of excitement, engagement, and to provide an overarching conceptual framework for the week. And anything that would devolve into just guy talking on stage at students, let's try to factor that out and put it into a much more effective learning environment, which is very often self-paced, maybe video-based, so they can rewind, fast forward, look at the transcript, click on an example, and engage in real time. Because there's just too much risk in most any lecture of zoning out, as um, happens incredibly often, I'm sure, among students. It's happening right now. <laughs> I was waiting for the setup there. Um, and you miss something key, and then it's a waste of your time sitting there for another half hour, 45 minutes, because you, you, you got lost. And that's a shame. And I have so many recollections of sitting in class lost. And so I'm trying to minimize that now. And indeed, we've decreased uh, the lecture's length from 90 minutes to 60 minutes. This coming year, we'll probably eliminate some of the lectures altogether that don't lend themselves to demonstrations on stage, to volunteerism, to interactive Q&A. Anything that's going to devolve into just me talking on stage at students, surely we can do better than that. So I don't think they're going to go away. Um, in fact, I do think they serve a valuable role in terms of engagement with the class. But I don't think they need to happen as frequently as they once did. And it's hard to give up because I'll admit I, this is the one of the aspects of the class that I love. Even though it's a super small fraction of the time I spend on CS50, the lectures, it's by far one of the most fun things. But I think you need to let go of that and make the decision based not on what you yourself like or I might really like and based on what feels best. And after all, there's always next year, so you'll have plenty of time to actually lecture if that's appealing. But I don't think we should do that um, just because we have a captive audience. Mm -hmm. The value of this variable that's apparently called muted. I didn't call it something boring like n. I called it an English word. And these examples are deliberately chosen and inspired by some of the, the examples online too to use some of the iconography that comes with Scratch, like the seal and the, the Scratch cat itself. And choosing deliberately the most obnoxious boy, uh, tone that you can so that students kind of remember that moment. And frankly, this too I would say is a theme in CS50. Almost always, if I can involve sound in a demonstration, or better yet, video, like we do. I mean, almost all the Scratch projects we demo in class have some audio component because I just feel it's more engaging mm -hmm. and it means I don't have to be the only sound students here and this is tricky here so I was kind of jumping around deliberately for time's sake and also because I wanted to see get the sense of the room as to where we should go but it's hard sometimes honestly to jump around um, even if you name the files in advance and all that but I'm not sticking to a script I guess is the takeaway mm -hmm. The only difference is we've changed the costume, so to speak, and we're having him say what that actual number is. And each of these examples, and this is distilled, I would say, in those walkthrough videos that I alluded to earlier, is meant to highlight some topic or some progression of complexity. Mm -hmm. So in this case here, we do indeed have a variable that's storing a count, and the sheep is saying as much. Multiple scripts. You can have two sprites. Here, I wanted to demonstrate essentially multi-threading, where you have both a cat and a bird having this interactivity, where one's chasing the other, but they're effectively doing that in parallel, or at least the illusion of parallel, mm -hmm. assuming there's just one CPU or core involved. So a lot of the, I'm sure. <coughs> I'm sure a lot of the students that are looking at this probably can get a grasp even without your description of no I heard the I heard the, the roar <laughs> no but um, I'm sure that many of them can kind of grasp what's happening because it's very I mean you can essentially read the the, the script and it tells you essentially what is happening so it seems as though the, the difficult thing that a lot of students probably have is that the, the distinction of knowing that there's these blocks and that they can achieve some sort of goal, but figuring out how, what that mental process is to actually design the program. So given a problem and actually approaching this problem solving of needing to create the program from scratch, so to speak, when there's nothing actually on the, on the script yet. So how, how much is that, so where in, in all of these different types of resources that you have available for students, where is that uh, given to students? Like how can they get that information or how can they get that thought process? That's in the problem set specification itself. So what we do is point students in the form of a long form narrative, so text written by me, um, intermingled with videos by Zamila, who leads most of our walkthroughs. We introduce um, students to a number of additional examples and I try to draw their attention in text form to certain aspects of a program and I try to ask some rhetorical questions along the way for instance well how did the author of that program 
uh, respond to key presses? How did the author of that program have MIT know where to go? And to try to break down the program into these smaller building blocks and to send a super explicit message in the spec that you should not set out to implement some complex game or artwork or in animation um, from the get-go. Pick one aspect of it and focus on that, making that sprite move or making that sprite change color. And then once you're comfortable with that, layer on top of that. And to really take these baby steps and to break things down stepwise into smaller components. So we don't talk about it too formally until we get to actual C code, but the goal in the piece that spec is to help them realize that a fairly complex looking project is really just the result of some very small locally optimal decisions quite often. So would you say that so I think that maybe one of the perceptions of the problem sets is that the specifications are just almost too long, like mm -hmm. somewhat unwieldy. Um, it seems to me that an obvious way of, of converting or bringing CS50 into, uh, like say, a high school setting where you do have a captive audience for some amount of time might be then to talk about that, so to talk about the specification in, in the class That's and actually fair. go through that thought process absolutely. Of, of solving this problem. You could absolutely leave the p-sets to be mostly just the exercises of the coding and the creation of the project, and then a lot of the narrative can be factored out and put into class. Mm -hmm. In our case, it's deliberate that it's in the p-sets because I want them to be not just a regurgitation of what we did in class or an assessment of what we did in class, but themselves teaching opportunities. And very often, too, you're speaking to a more sort of core goal of understanding encapsulation and stepwise refinement and building a software from nothing right. to something. But even some of the more mundane stuff like Chamad and changing the permissions of a file, that does not really warrant time on the, the stage of this theater. Mm -hmm. But they should know the mechanics of making things world readable, accessible, um, executable. And so that's in the form of the spec. And we use that actually as an opportunity to talk about octal notation, which a Linux system typically uses. So that's a role, too, that the specs play, is to continue the teaching, sometimes for, uh, I think, compelling pedagogical purposes, but also just some practical mechanical mm -hmm. But that is a good point, I think, and we can probably do a better job in the problem set specifications of indexing them or formatting them even in a way that allows the teacher to factor out some of the narrative and do that on the fly in class Lessons and, and still allow students to dive classes. into a specific point. Do you, think that would, do you think that would still work well though? If So assuming that you take the specifications as they are now, that you're able to actually factor out some of that and actually present that in a, in a classroom setting? Or does it, do you think it needs some an adaptation to that? Too. A little bit of adaptation, but I think that's one of, will be one of our foci this coming year, is exactly that, to make things a little and more now, modular. Deep this, of course, is inspired by Jack Handy and Saturday Night Live, <laughs> for students who might remember or Today, know that. I got hit in the got face hit. with a phone book. Phone book. <laughs> Confusing as I'm at home, <laughs> watching. That's it. Mercy is 50 explained to me, Sarah. <laughs>